Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. It is two o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started with this session. Um, this is a webinar on risk management framework best practices for robotic process automation and bot security. And this webinar was put together by ATARC's RPA project team, which is led by industry chair Bill Bunce at Automation Anywhere. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I just want to remind you all uh, as attendees, if you have questions, Questions, to please put them in the Q&A chat down below and we've reserved time at the end of our panel uh, to answer those questions. So with that, I will hand it over to opening remarks and we'll be hearing from Dirk. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to thank everybody for your attendance. Um, first, I'd like to thank the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center, also known as um, ATARC. For hosting this um, and also would like to um, thank um, our amazing and distinguished moderator panelists and of course the attendees so thank you all very very much next um, i'd like to discuss with you um, the idea of what risk management framework is and that's just to establish a level set of understanding um, so that as we talk about the risks of this um, throughout the rest of this course you'll understand what we're talking about i'm going to uh, share my screen and then I'm going to show you what that looks like. All right. Hang on. Go away. Okay. All right. Um, so there's, let me, let me do this for you as well. Here it is. These are the links I'm going to use with this the descriptions and I'll put them in the chat session momentarily. All right, so NIST came up with this thing called risk management framework. Um, essentially what it is, it's, it's a, an approach in which you can evaluate your applications or your information systems to make sure that um, as they are developed, uh, as they come online and, and introduce them to sustainment, that they actually have an acceptable amount of risk to the entire enterprise. Uh, so, and they came up with this neat little thing, um, and it's a framework, and it's repeatable, um, and if you follow it, uh, the expectation is, is that you'll start from step, uh, technically step zero, um, and you'll go to step number six, um, and I'm just going to briefly go over those for you real quick. Um, on the first uh, link I'm going to provide to you, you'll see this page, and you're going to see this, um, this image. I'm just going to put, this is a little reverse sonar. Um, I'm going to guide your eyes with it in a minute. So uh, if you click on this link, um, you can right click on it and you can actually show it as an image. And that's what I want to do for the rest of this. I'm only going to spend a few minutes on each one of these. So what I'm going to draw your attention to is the very center. Again, it's the very center of this diagram. It's called prepare. And that's actually step zero. I know some people that have some eh about that. Um, but the idea is, is that you prepare for each one of these steps um, as you move into them and as you move out of them. So it's a constant state of preparation. And that's kind of a new thing, but it, the idea, it wasn't, under, it wasn't explained, but now it's understood um, because it's now visualized. So what we'll do is we'll go straight up um, and we're going to work clockwise. Uh, the steps are these light blue balloons. Um, it starts with this one and we'll work our way around. It's called Categorize System. And directly above it, in this dark blue banner, this, I mean, they have these little um, dividers. It's kind of hard to see here, but this reference here um, is, the, is the regulation uh, or the, the required elements that you need to, to follow to execute the step. And then the outer band um, are the overarching guiding documentation for the entire process. So it's got the overarching, you've got the specific uh, requirements and guidance documents, and you actually have the steps. So you can categorize your system. And just briefly, when you categorize your system, it comes up with a categorization of low, moderate, or high. Uh, that's based on two things. It's based on your data types and it's also based on your system itself. After you do that, you then move to step number two, which, excuse me, guess step number two. Uh, we're going to go clockwise to select controls. If you follow that same uh, structure I mentioned earlier, this is, the te this is the actual step. These are the actual references and the requirements. Um, and what it tells you to do in select controls is just go back to what you came up with, your categorized system, and then go to this other document and select that baseline of controls. So if you are a low system, you are required to do low controls. If you are a moderate system, you're required to do moderate controls. 
And if you are high system, you have to do high. Uh, once you do that, you then move to the third step, and that's implement controls. Again, we're about four o'clock, on, on, and I'm going to do a little control button if that do a reverse sonar. Now, when you implement your controls, what it essentially what it says is you take your baselines, and now you're required to actually implement them, and that means you actually have to put them in practice. You have to document how you put them in practice, and you have to uh, prove that they're working. And I'm going to switch uh, real quick before I go much further to this site. Um, this is the National Vulnerability Database. It has all of 853 controls. It's currently REF4, REF5 is out. Um, but what I want to show you, um, and this is nothing, this is a fancy uh, database. Um, and if you click on one of these links anywhere on here, it kind of executes a query based on what you're doing. So these are all the control families. Uh, you'll notice one missing, it's the privacy control family. Um, but the, the, um, when REF5 comes out, we'll see those explicitly called out. Uh, but if you go into any one of these, and you'll see, for example, this is access control. It's the first. It's also a technical control. And it has a tendency, the most um, arduous when you first start out. I've never done one of these before. But you'll notice that it has these low, moderate, and highs over here. If you are a low system, moderate system, or high system, you're required to do the controls underneath. If it's blank, then you don't. Um, so that's what the implement controls means. You are required to implement these controls. I'm just going to show you that one. There's 16 more of them. I'm, I'm not going to show them. I can only have a few minutes. So when you implement your controls, you're required to go back into those baselines and, and start from the top, go to the way bottom. You can cut and slice it and dice it. Um, I will tell you that there's some resource constraints because um, mo mostly the people that are doing the actual implementation um, are the ones that are responsible for showing that it's working. Um, and they're also trying to implement. So there's a little bit of a conflict. Start early. Um, and you won't have to run into that. So then the fourth step is something referred to as assess controls. And then same construct, 853A is a, um, it's the same document that we just looked at, but it tells you how you can assess it. There are some recommendations because some folks are having some problems with how you actually assess the controls. And if you can reverse engineer the tests, um, it'll help you explain how you can implement it. And what happens when you assess the controls is that um, an entity will come in and evaluate them, and it will generate a report. Part of the implement controls, going back to step three, is it, that there's a set of controls that actually require you to create artifacts. You take those artifacts, you take some of the, the deliverables that come out of this assess the controls, and then you submit them, which is step five, to somebody to review it. Um, here at the, at the Department of Veterans Affairs, we have authorizing officials, and those authorizing officials review the package, and what they're reviewing as you move all the way through this is the overall risk that's left. And they get, a, they get an artifact. The artifact that you try to get in this authorized step number five is the authority to operate. It's the ATO. All ATOs have conditions. Uh, some of them are three months. The longest one can possibly be 36. Uh, some have POAMs, some say you must move into this, this, and the other, um, but all ATOs have conditions of some sort, um, and OMB got rid of temporary ATOs, FATOs, and all those fun things, and they just recognize ATOs. Uh, the next step is the actual final step, and that's like the utopian, euphoric, nirvana state for all of these information systems, and it's step six called monitor controls. Um, NIST does it a little differently. They call it continuous monitoring, but you get the idea. You put, you put your system into the state where it gets continuously scanned and um, you come up with a continuous monitoring scan plan. And then you evaluate those, those risks perpetually until you get something called a significant change or a, or a major change. And so when you get one of those, it starts from step six and goes right into step one, and you start all over again. And that's the risk management framework at a very high level. There's a lot of steps in each one of those. Um, that's what we, that's uh, basically what we do here at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, and I, oops, didn't mean to do that. Sorry. And I want to go just to give everybody an understanding. Again, this is all available. I'll put it in the chat session. Um, I'm going to stop sharing just momentarily. And I'll get to the chat in a minute. All right. Now, um, one of the things that we want to talk about and how do you understand what RMS is, 
is that there are control families um, that are potentially impacted by having this thing called a bot or part of the RPA technology, robotic process automation. Um, things such as you know, privacy controls need to be evaluated. We look at access controls in that list. And then there's a, a series of the other ones under there that are impacted by the existence of a bot being on your information system. At the VA, uh, we've actually started to integrate uh, security and privacy into the application, excuse me, into the bot development lifecycle to ensure that as the, as the bot is developed and deployed, uh, we've already met the requirements that you need to actually get that thing uh, deployed and implemented into the, into the environment. Also, um, we've developed some, some artifacts to help systems that already have a bot inside their environment um, and how it impacts their ETO package because, because, because like I said, it's actually present versus it being created from the start. With that, I would like to hand over to Carrie Lee. Carrie? Hi, Dark. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the overview of RMF. So I'm Carrie Lee. I'm the Acting Director of Digital Transformation Security at the Department of Veterans Affairs, and I'm also our RPA lead. I will um, be your moderator for today's discussion. Um, as Dark said, we are standing up our first um, overall RPA enterprise-wide platform. And we're very excited to hear what our panelists have to share and learn from their experiences. So I'd like to give each panelist an opportunity to introduce himself. So first we have Dr. Steve Harrison. Hi, yes, my name's uh, Steve Harrison. I'm uh, an adjunct professor in artificial intelligence and cybersecurity with Capital Technology University. I have over 37 years experience in the federal government and the IT sector of the federal government. I'm also a member of the Cyber Marine Corps. I'm very, uh, look very forward to participating in your uh, discussion today. Thank you. Great, thanks, Steve. So now we have Paul Beckman. Good afternoon, my name is Paul Beckman. Um, I am currently the Chief Information Security Officer of an LLC company called Consolidated Nuclear Security, which is effectively a company that uh, was uh, built upon an award of a contract placed by the Department of Energy uh, and shared between two primary companies of Bechtel and Lidos. I am a Lidos affiliate, uh, but I act as the Chief Information Security Officer of this company called CNS. Prior to joining CNS back in March, I spent about 14 years as a federal employee over at the Department of Homeland Security, my last position with them being the Chief Information Security Officer of DHS. Happy to be here. Great, thanks, Paul. So now we have uh, Sanam Baruman. Hi, can you guys hear me okay? All right, great. Hi, I'm Sanam Borman. I'm the founder and CEO of Maine Digital. Um, we're an organization that's focused on working with actually commercial clients in the private sector on intelligent automation. Prior to find, uh, founding uh, Maine Digital, um, I held other leadership roles in Fortune 500 companies focused on automation programs before it was actually called RPA. It's been around for a while, so. Great, thanks. So uh, Jim Walker is next. Thanks, Gary. My name's Jim Walker. I'm with UiPath. Um, I spent 32 years in federal government, um, 10 years in artillery. There's not a lot of use for um, uh, te technology there anymore, but in um, the 22 years after that, I worked all in, in uh, IT operations at Missile Defense Agency at NASA and Shared Services Center. Uh, we put the first robots in production down at the NASA Shared Services Center, and uh, really excited to be talking about this topic because if you don't start with security, your bot program is doomed to fail. So this should be a good hour. Great. Thanks, yeah. Jim. And uh, last, we have John Walden. My name is John Walden. I am the Chief Technology Officer for Blue Prism. Uh, Blue Prism is a slightly different paradigm than some of the other vendors out there from the perspective of it's really more about the automation and not necessarily the individual bot, individualized bot. And the reason this is important is because I'm a diverse technologist. I've been doing technology in general for, I'll round down and say 30 years, but I've done everything from program to DBA to uh, big data orientations. And this technology is the most exciting in general, just because the idea of automating um, when Jim, as, as Jim says, when it's done right, it's a shoe in for fantastic returns, both from a time perspective for people, as well as a monetary perspective. So it's always really exciting to discuss the topics. 
Great, thanks, John. So um, during the panel, I will be asking the panelists a series of questions. And at the end, we will be saving 10 minutes for question and answers. If you do have any questions and answer, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, or for some of you, we'll be at the top. So our first question I'm gonna to address to Paul. Um, how have you seen government agencies approach the ATO process for RPA? And have you found any RMF requirements that are impacted by RPA? Oh, that's a, it's a good question. Um, you know, in talking to my colleagues uh, across the spectrum, whether they be in federal or, or industry, it's, it's being handled in a number of different ways. Uh, but the way in which I think is most effective is thinking about RPA uh, for what it is. I mean, at the end of the day, it's code, it's, it's software. And, and like all software, it needs to adhere to whatever software development or system development lifecycle you have in place today. I think, you know, going back to Dirk's comments about the 800-53 controls, um, I think this would be SA3, uh, living in the SA family uh, within 800-53. And with any SDLC, uh, RPAs need to go through, so let's just go through the cycle real quick. You gotta go through planning, you gotta go through analysis, you have to go through design. And it's really at this design stage where you should probably be doing some really robust threat modeling uh, within the design stage. Next, you move on to implementation. And during the implementation stage, you really should be doing some static, leveraging some static analysis code scanning tools to really get in there and review the code in an automated fashion. And then you move on to testing and integration. This is probably the most important piece from a cyber perspective for me um, is that testing and integration. And there you're going to be performing some really robust security focused testing. I mean, pen test the heck out of this code before you get to a comfort level where you're willing to take it from development into your production network. And then lastly, of course, you roll into the maintenance stage. So, you know, as Dirk was indicating, there are a lot of control families associated uh, that are impacted by RPA, but in my mind's eye, uh, getting your arms around uh, and adhering to your already established and defined, your implemented, Software development lifecycle is going to be key in, in enabling the RPA through your RMF. As far as the impact piece goes, um, uh, or the you know the requirements that are impacted, I'd probably go back to that that threat modeling piece uh, of when you do that on, on your RPA. You know, Dirk was talking about um, you know, the RMF phases. First one being the categorization uh, of a system, and in the categorization, as Dirk was mentioning, you are evaluating the impact to confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And those impact assessments, determinations, derive or, or drive your determination of whether or not you've got low, moderate, or high impact to losing confidentiality, integrity, and availability. In addition to evaluating the impacts to CIA, the CIA triad, I'm recommending that, um, that you do that threat modeling there. You know, not all RPAs are going to require the same controls, regardless of that impact, to some degree. Uh, and, and the risk management framework put out by NIST allows you the flexibility to do a tailor control selection in some cases. But back to my point that not all RPAs are creating the same, and I'm just pulling these out as sheer examples. You know, an RPA, you know, maybe monitoring or managing environmental controls or something like that. The controls you need for that are going to be a lot different than the controls needed for an RPA that's going to be managing financial data, medical data, something that is uh, you know, going to have a lot of access to PII data. So use that threat modeling piece, really get a good understanding of what the threats are going to be to that RPA. And then in addition to the controls that you're going to get through the FIPS 199 categorization, use that select tailor, uh, that tailoring part uh, to really make sure that you've got the right controls for the right RPA. Great, thanks, Paul. Um, I think uh, I'd like to ask Steve his opinion with all his years of government service. What um, are your thoughts around this? Yeah, I did my dissertation on a, a basically a case study on the RMF and with uh, enterprise services and what was referred to before as a CIA or AIC availability and uh, integrity and confidentiality, cybersecurity uh, triad. One of the findings that I found is that oftentimes, if a organization has a policy on bots or malicious code, they don't always develop test plans or tests for it. And what ends up happening is they really end up finding out too late that they really, their, their policy wasn't adequate and their risk taking wasn't adequate. So I always think of it as a, a continual life cycle for this risk management. 
You have the development of policy, you have the testing formation, you have also taken into account the user needs, the requirements, and also the threat environment. Based on those factors, you then update your policy on it. What, what, you know, there's also the other extreme I just want to quickly mention where I, I was at a cubicle a number of years ago and I heard this banging noise and I went to go see what it was and it was this program manager banging his head against the wall. I said, why are you doing this? He said, well, I've been trying to get this release, a software release for over eight months, but I can't get it done because we keep having these updated uh, accreditation issues we need to fix. So when I said, well, did you work with the AO and the operations at that time, the customers uh, to resolve this and come up with a baseline? He said, no, I've been doing it independently. I said, well, why don't you bring them all together and come up and manage your baselines and basically manage your risk management process so that you can produce some uh, basically uh, software without having to hold it so long to identify the risk to include bots. But that's basically my summary is to take a life cycle approach to this and continual effort approach to manage the threat. Thank you. Um, so the next question is related to security review. So Sanam, I was gonna ask you this, what type of security reviews have you seen conducted for each new bot and as um, the bots progress through the life cycle and changes need to be made, what type of security reviews are you seeing then? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I think similar to what Paul was saying earlier, right? Um, RPA is another type of software um, that's being implemented. And so in terms of security reviews, at least what we've seen in the commercial side, it's, it's really not any different um, than any other type of software implementation that we would be doing per se. I think that the one area where there probably is a little bit of a difference um, outside of you know, the, the, the typical you know, code reviews, rule reviews, testing, et cetera, um, is the access, um, which I think you know, in terms of how much access the bots have and the credentialing of the bots, um, as everyone's aware, right, bots, you know, de depending on how your environment is configured, um, need their credentials to, to access the different systems to be able to perform what, um, again, depending on the process that you're working in, what maybe a human worker in the past would do or now the digital worker would do. And so I do think that's probably the one area that's a little different, although, again, similar to privilege access for um, our people users, uh, same level of, of scrutiny and review and credentialing. Um, so you know, that, that to me is maybe where the slight difference is um, in terms of um, the security reviews. I think that's a great point um, to make there and foot stomp on. When you really break down what RPA is, you're kind of effectively uh, automating some repeatable tasks that would traditionally have been done by a human being, right? So all of the controls, back to Sonic's point, all of the controls that you need to have on a human identity, authentication, authorization, monitoring, auditing, logging, all of the controls associated to what you need to do for a human, you need to have the exact same controls for an RPA. It's really effectively just a digitized worker at that point. Well, that's funny because in your comments earlier, you know, you were talking specifically about SDLC and I was thinking that exact same thing is the fact that both Cybercom and NIST really have yet to address this. So when you talk about ATO requirements, it's, it's dependent process by process, depending on what they're going to access. But until Cybercom and NIST really address this idea of a credentialization for a digital worker, I think we're going to have a lot of struggles and um, extra hurdles that have to be gone through. I totally agree, John. Okay, thank you guys. So um, also unique, I think, to RPA platform or enterprise RPA center of excellence is how the security um, architecture would work for that. Because you have one system that manages multiple bots that talk to multiple systems all through the enterprise or even external to the enterprise. So um, Jim, you've seen this done at a lot of agencies. So what have you seen in terms of security architecture, segmentation and so forth when it comes to um, RPA systems? Yeah, so I, I, um, I kind of keyed off of Paul earlier talking about it, it was just software, but, but the more that I see, so we've had like 79 or more government installations now. And agencies are finally getting back to what we thought when we first started this at NASA. Think of them as teleworkers. And how does a teleworker traverse boundaries? 
They traverse boundaries with good auditable credentials. They have single sign-on. They use VPN. They have roles-based access. Your automation, attended or an unattended robot, needs to have that at its very core because then everyone's able to think about it. These aren't anything special. They're emulating existing processes you do. If you're at the Veterans Administration and you're accessing a medical record from another hospital for a veteran and you're bringing that in and you're sharing it with a nurse and a doctor and when you're done, you're gonna update that and push it back across. All you're doing with RPA is emulating that human behavior through an automated fashion. The only thing I would argue this difference is the speed. Right? You, you want the single sign-on, you want the bot to log in so you can follow that, you want to have roles-based access so it can only access the records of a veteran that it's authorized to, to access. You only want it to be able to work during hours that you might want it to work so you could limit its time. You want it to take all the NIST controls, but at the end of the day, the minute you start using RPA, you're more secure than you were the day before. Yeah, do you want to speak a little on that and how it improves security also through, you know, less mistakes and, um, you know, less chance of um, malicious actions? Exactly. Think about it. No one's ever going to call your call center up and say, I need the password for the bot because it's on vacation. Right. The bot promises to never put itself in the back of the car and take itself home. It cannot download data to its private laptop or print data on a printer that it's not authorized to print on. You know, it needs those rules the same way people do, and you know how to give people. So at NASA, they have the, the NASA uh, Access Management System, NAMS. When we started the first bot, George Washington had to have credentials. Now, when we very first started, we actually called downstairs to try to change the password because at the time we were just using a password and a login for the prototype. And the call agent actually says, you're not authorized to change Mr. Washington's password, can he call? Which was a great catch, right? We, we don't want everybody to be able to access the bot and do whatever they want with the bot. So the bot, by the very nature that they're there doing a repetitive task, there's no collusion in finance. If you've got five people in your finance office, that's 25 opportunities for them to figure out a way to steal money. Your bots won't talk to each other in that way, so they won't try to figure out how to skim a penny off of every transaction at the IRS. So in, in some respects, yeah, I'm not saying you're making leaps and bounds, but you're more secure because you don't have to worry about social engineering. You don't have to worry about data being extracted from the organization's network. You don't have to worry about the, the bots talking to each other and in collusion. You have to worry about that with people. That's what our insider threat's all about. Right. So, John, you've also seen a lot of installations at various commercial and government um, customers. So what have you seen as far as security architecture and boundaries um, through your work? Well, similar to Jim, I mean, this is a learning process or has been a learning process for all of our customers, whether the gov or the private sector. I've, I, similar stories. I mean, we've had some companies who got upset when they put the bots into the uh, HR system and label them all as mail because it adjusted the uh, hiring practices. We've had people, you know, robots be sent emails that they didn't attend their onboarding sessions. And that's where I was getting one of my comments, Paul, earlier, is you do have to think of these things as entities, but use common sense to understand. And I think as, as you know, 853 and some of the other cybercom type elements get changed and think about this, they're going to better understand it. With regards to the security architecture, it's incredibly important because unfortunately, a lot of times in the matter of desktops, when you're doing automations just on a desktop, you're using the same credentials as a person. And, you know, we've always talked about the idea of, the, and, and Jim just mentioned this, the idea of quantity, quality, and resourcing that an RPA can impact and have handles on. Because of the amount of work that's being done, you don't necessarily want from an audit trail to say that you, Carrie Lee, has made these 10,000 entries in a system. In some places, that'll actually trigger an alert and if you haven't notified them and thought about the impact of Carrie Lee from her desktop running an automation, that's going to show up as a flag because, frankly, a no human could do those types of activities. That's why when I made the comments earlier, it's important to really think about the security ahead of time, 
make sure you've communicated with the right organization so that they understand how you're doing RPA and think about the fact that it's, it's not just a digital worker or a bot doing one thing, but you want to think about them being able to do more things, which is why that security architecture is important. Because as you begin to develop access to different systems, you can segregate that real easily by role access, by um, having them traverse different areas that normally a person may not even have access to because of the things that Jim was just mentioning, the fact that they're not going to copy, they're not going to look, they're not going to make mistakes. And everything is audited, unlike uh, you know, classic human behavior, you can literally, and it's, this is a little bit something to consider early, think about the data that's going to come from an RPA solution as compared to from a human. You're not going to know the 17 clicks that it took for a human to get something. Well, you can know that from a digital worker perspective. And that audit is incredibly important when you look at things later on from that perspective. I know I went a little bit on diatribe, but I, hopefully that answers the question. So I have a follow-up to that. Sure. So um, generally, um, you know, the pieces within a system would end up within that um, accreditation boundary for that system. With RPA, you have bots acting on many systems. Uh, do you typically see that within the uh, authorization boundary of that RPA center of excellence or RPA system? Or do you see those bots within the uh, authorization boundary of the system it's acting on? Some of both. It, some of that depends on the maturity that people have gotten to and I'm not meaning insult or to anything, but Gov tends to be a little bit slower on getting to the point where some of corporate is. You know, corporate has recognized that a digital worker, just by its nature, is probably going to gradually get more and more rights. Most organizations start off very secure, very, you know, they have access to this one system, but then when you add a, something else for the digital worker to do and something else, it, their rights have to be expanded. Now, when they sign on, they can use different credentials for different systems. If you've got single sign-on, that certainly is capable as well. But you have to give consideration that a digital worker is going to work, as Paul initially said, as a human to do work, okay? That's the whole idea of not making it all be code, not necessarily being all API orientation, but really focus at enabling the business user to automate what they're doing in a fashion that's going to allow a digital worker to mimic that to a great extent. And sometimes the consideration when you're going across accreditation boundaries really complicate the things because unfortunately Gov is still very early in its RPA journey uh, from that perspective. As, as again, Cybercom and NIST begin to really consider a digital worker, I think that'll hopefully get easy. Until then, you do have to have multiple credentials and a way to manage them. It's all built into several of the systems uh, that exist that are being utilized by a number of our customers uh, within the bounds of Gov and corporate. And that's just has to be planned when you're choosing what processes to do. And as I said, a digital worker may access a lot of different processes. So while it may seem that that digital worker is having a lot of rights, realistically it's not because within the bounds of any particular process, it may only have those rights for those minutes. Once it signs out, it's not gonna do anything else. Hopefully that's a, makes sense. Yeah, so Jim, do you have any follow-up to that? Just a quick follow-up. So if, if I were at the USDA and I was working things related to the food stamp program and I was doing it with the 50 states, the minute that we decide to do some type of electronic connection together, there's a process already in place for us to talk about me and my employees coming into your system and doing work. That same conversation should happen as a result of you going live with your digital labor, right? And in that, uh, when we started the George Washington bot, we had to start John Adams because our first bot was doing some stuff in finance and they did not want the idea of a single bot having multiple credentials. Technically, from an audit perspective, it's a beautiful thing, right? To maximize your value and, and the purchasing price of a bot. But for us at the time, it was just smarter to have two separate bots, two licenses, so that one did accounts receivable and one did accounts payable, right? You, you don't have to change your existing security. You just have to appreciate if I could do 10,000 processes today, then the log still shows 10,000. 
I'm not using an attended bot with myself to do 10,000 of one thing. I couldn't do that on my own. The unattended bot with its credentials will certainly show up. So the speed, Small Business Administration during the middle of COVID stopped the use of RPA because their legacy system was creating a denial of service because they couldn't ingest fast enough. It wasn't because it was less secure. It was just too fast. And you can fix that as we grow our automations. Yeah, we saw that same thing with the PPP program as well right. from that perspective. Um, and that's, again, that's part of the thinking ahead. I mean, if you're if you recognize that you're going to add some number of digital workers, generally there's a very large multiplier for the amount of work that a digital worker can do and a person. Um, you've got to recognize that and begin to think about it. You know, insurance, just like he was talking about the FDA, insurance usually has cross um, cross state venues and different rules for every state. And you just have to give that consideration. And sometimes the creativity that Jim just mentioned, we've seen that a number of customers use that where you end up with different robots actually working together. I talk a lot about, you know, this idea of the workforce. You know, I usually call it a unified workforce. It's not a matter of, of the people and the digital workers. It's a matter of how do they do stuff together. And oftentimes what you end up doing is either have humans give work to digital workers or digital workers give, distribute work to other digital workers. And it's just understanding that, you know, something that we find so simple as humans, you know, if I'm doing a junior accounting type activity, I'm going to give that to a junior accountant as compared to if I'm doing something more complex, I may handle it. And when you begin to really think about that work distribution, that's when RPA and digital workers really begin to blossom. Great. Thank you, guys. So uh, earlier, uh, Jim and John touched on the insider threat and how um, RPA actually helps mitigate some of that. I'm wondering, Paul, what you have seen um, acting as a CISO and insider threat being such a huge um, uh, <laughs> project that you need to um, take care of. So I'm wondering what you've seen and how you've seen RPA impact insider threat. It's an interesting question. Um, I would come at it from probably three angles on what I regard to be a double-edged sword. So on one edge, um, you know, I think it enables insider threat defense. Um, it can enable uh, the access controls, putting least privilege on steroids to a very large degree. So in that regard, it can enable insider threat defense in a very big way. Uh, in addition to that, I think it enables the insider threat uh, analyst, the one who's got eyeballs on glass looking for the insider threat. And through auditing and logging, I think RPA can literally, not literally, I'm sorry, effectively put that insider threat analyst on anyone's shoulder for shoulder serving to be able to be aware of all keystrokes being typed, uh, you know, screen recordings, effectively being able to be aware of everything anybody is doing on that machine during the session that they are doing that. So that's on the good edge. But like so many things in IT, Technology can be used for good and consequently can also be used for bad. So as a uh, paranoid CISO, I worry sometimes about what uh, RPA is going to enable from a malicious side of the house and what an insider with, you know, who is a tech savvy kind of individual, what they would be able to do in leveraging RPA uh, in a very bad way. The, you know, in, in a very manual process, the amount of data one can collect and exfiltrate is probably limited because it's a human doing it. But when you enable an RPA to go collect uh, and exfiltrate uh, information at machine speed, it, it's something that uh, worries me uh, at some points in time. But yeah, those are the three aspects I think of how RPA is affecting the insider threat. So let's get to other types of threats. Uh, Sanam, um, are there any threats you've identified specific to RPA? And what about the RPA supply chain since RPA, or I mean, since supply chain is such a hot topic right now? Yeah, uh, so, you know, I, I think it, I don't, I don't want to repeat kind of some of the stuff that we've already said, but it, it goes, I think, kind of back to the beginning, right? So in terms of what are you automating? Um, what are the processes that you're looking at? What's the data that's involved? And what does the architecture look like? I think those are all, um, as, as you're putting together your governance for your RPA program and, and selecting what you're going to automate, I think, you know, these are things that you need to be looking at up front to reduce the overall risk. Um, associated with RPA. Um, so I think we've talked a little bit about that um, already. Um, and then specifically around the, the supply chain itself, um, I, I'm not familiar with too many threats that are out there um, that aren't, um, I would say kind of more um, 
just prevalent in, in overall software development uh, specific to RPA itself. I'd, I'd love to hear from the other panelists if they have any thoughts on that. I'll chime in if I might. I mean, it, the idea of specific threats of RPA really get down to what we, we've sort of monikered as a robotic operating model and having a COE. Right. And that's really critical. It's one thing to have um, a lot of people doing processes, creating processes, recording processes, but they have to go through, as Paul initially started, um, some form of SDLC, some form of verification. Um, yeah. That idea has to go through really a COE. And the COE not only allows you to look at these things from the perspective of uh, the risk framework, you know, being able to view and verify, do the testing, all those other things, but it also provides you the ability to manifest more effectively the processes that you are automating because you've got some understanding as to what's already been automated, what you can reuse and those types of elements. Carrie, you asked about the supply chain. So right back to this is software. It's in a box. It's got a license. So you still have to have all of the in U.S. friendly countries. You have to have U.S. people work in the call centers. You have to have U.S. people that are coming to your site with a clearance to do all the work. The supply chain rules aren't touched at all, whether it's UiPath or if it's Calendar Creator Plus. And that's just to see who's old on the call that knows what Calendar Creator Plus is. Uh, so um, you, you don't have anything special as a result of that. But Paul was talking about the insider threat a, a couple of minutes ago, and I have to chuckle. I often think when Christine Jex, who's back at NASA now, but she spent a couple of years at the Army putting their program in place. She was my CISO when I was a deputy CIO at the Shared Services Center. Came in my office on Monday morning screaming, what's George Washington doing? And I'm like, what are you talking about? She was auditing George Washington as any other employee, and it did something at two o'clock in the morning on Sunday, and she wanted to know why. And we suddenly realized how great that is. We didn't need some new thing in place. We could tell if our bots were doing things they weren't supposed to do because we monitor our people, and that showed up as a regular person. If it's doing it faster, we can stop it but at least we can catch it. We don't have the whole new layer to bring on to somehow treat the bot as if it's superhuman. Yeah, back to our point, right, Jim? I mean, the same controls you generally want to apply to a human are going to port over and convey uh, on the RPA side. And I, I just want to foot stomp your point. I agree, the supply chain rules do not change at all. You can have the best developed RPO code in the world, most secure, but if you're not managing the integrity of that, uh, and ensuring that that never gets modified, now then we get another solar winds on our hands, right? Uh, so yeah, supply chain rules apply just the same, do not change at all, I agree. I would suggest one little difference though. We've been talking about the COE. Think uh, one layer up from that, you have your CIO's office and they have a change management program. And that's where your software gets introduced to your network. I would not want you to think that a process being automated has to go to your CIO for change management. I believe they're at your C COE where the software has already been approved to work. So what you're testing is, is this function that we did manually performing the way we expected it to perform in an automated fashion and to not require every, now in one agency, initially GSA treated each automation as an ATO, it took forever to get the things through. You know, but if you realize that once you approve the bot and you approve the orchestrator and the control software and that, that now you just have to validate with user acceptance testing, nothing new, user acceptance testing, your process, check your business rules and check and see how you throttle that thing so it doesn't overwhelm another system. But you don't have to go back to an entire ATO process, but still use the good principles of the risk management framework. And let me throw out another, I mean, again, coming over top, Jim, I mean, if you have a mature and robust, and a lot of people do, you know, a set DevOps, this pipeline by which you develop code, put it through these gateways and test that code, you know, ultimately getting to a point where you're comfortable in putting that production, this should follow that exact same set DevOps process. There you go. Great. So we've only got about five minutes left until time for question and answers. 
So I'd like to ask every panelist um, for a quick minute to talk about what are some lessons learned from um, they've had with RMF for RPA or R RPA security. Um, Jim's at the top of my screen, so I'll call on Jim first. Ooh, well, that's a fun one. Um, uh, system changes. So when you have four or five or six robots, you don't need a massive structure of a COE. You need to learn about your COE. But when you have a hundred bots and someone says we're making a change to Outlook, you need to be able to quickly identify which of those automations touch Outlook and then be able to retest them once your change has been made. Don't let the system get upgraded and you test it live. You know, and so we are starting to see a whole lot more emphasis on being able to test your automations or during and after a planned outage, and especially during an unplanned outage, instead of bringing in 30 people to manually test, and then you're kind of right, bring in your automations to test for your automations to make sure you're completely up before you start doing business, because you could be off on finance, you could move a medical record to the wrong place, you can't afford to be almost right, you need to be up and right. So Steve, I wanted to ask you next, um, you've been kind of quiet. So what are your thoughts as, on lessons learned? What I'd like to point out, one I'd like to point the, the audience to uh, NIST Special Pub 863 Revision 3 that uh, outlines digital guidelines and a lot of the topics that we discussed today. The second is uh, uh, if the bots and the uh, uh, digital identities are managed properly, I want to give an example of my wife is a hospital worker and she's an RN. And you know, this is a very trying time, but with the bots are, bots are managed properly, they were able, she was able to, the bots were able to basically take away some of the administrative uh, burdens that she wouldn't cover, uh, had to endure, and perform basically the healthcare, which she loved. So there is an employee enrichment that the bots can bring to the table during these times. Um, second, just like any other, there is insider threat and it's a case of managing it whether it be a digital identity or an employee, just like was said earlier. And through continual process management, working with your security and IA, you, you can address those threats. That's all I have, thank you. Great, thank you. What about you, Sonam? Sorry. You know, I, I think it goes back to what we were talking about before in terms of looking at the bots as digital workers and ensuring um, the appropriate level of access for what they're being asked to do. Um, that's the other kind of piece that's really important, right? Which is you have you know, a, a, a process or a value chain that might have 50 steps. If all 50 are being automated, great, but lots of times that's not the case. And so what is you know, the, the least amount of privilege access they need or access you know, the bot would need to perform the specific function? So really, Aligning the access to what's being performed, I think, is something that we're constantly coming across. Great. And then lastly, uh, John, what are your thoughts as far as lessons learned through all your deployments? I think the biggest lesson is really the aspect of figuring out where to start. You know, the fact is, is digital workers are, have been here for a while. Uh, Jim and I, you know, I talked with Jim about this when he was back at NASA five year, four or five years ago, probably five, six years ago now, time flies. Um, and it's, it's really a matter of figuring out where to start and recognizing that you want to basically understand the theory behind a digital workforce so that you can implement it correctly as you move forward. Because these, do, these things do move quickly. They are much easier to deploy and develop than Sort of the standard waterfall methodology of SDLC. So it has to be done within the bounds and sort of a, an agile type framework. Um, but when you do that, and when you recognize the power and capability of these things, you really want to find those processes that can deliver the highest value the most quickly. And those may be driven, as I said earlier, based upon something that's just quantity of work. It may be something that's based upon a quality of work, or it may be something of based upon our resources. And the resources doesn't impact the government sector as much, but especially during changing administrations and everything else, there's some concern there as well. And you don't want to let a, a human who knows a process walk out a door without having documented and possibly have some way to be able to automate some of that 
so that you have the resiliency within the bounds of whatever mission or organization or agency that you may be trying to um, help accomplish task, accomplish work. And that's really what automation comes down to is work accomplishment. Great. And I said lastly for John, but I didn't get to Paul yet. <laughs> so one more. <laughs> uh, lessons learned. I would probably say um, I, I've got a bunch of, of lessons learned I think I could offer here, but uh, I'll probably just proffer up two. One is, you know, as a risk manager, do that risk analysis. Just because something can be automated doesn't necessarily mean you should automate it. Uh, there may be some rare instances where when you're doing your risk analysis, the liability associated to automating a process may very well outweigh the efficiency gain that you would obtain in, in putting that bot out on your network. So not a lot of cases where that's gonna be the case, but all that is to say is not everything should be automated just because it can. And the last piece of advice I would just offer is, and this is probably stating the obvious, is get your leaders, uh, your, your vested uh, leaders um, involved up front. Primarily, I'll be looking at the chief privacy officer and your general counsel. Do not do a thing on RPA planning design um, or analysis without chief privacy officer and general counsel at the table, understanding exactly what it is you are trying to do there. They can throw some very big obstacles uh, down the road if you do not involve them from the get-go. Great, that's great, all of you. Um, good advice from all of you. So. Um, Let's see, we've got about nine minutes left. So I wanted to get to the question and answers. Um, let's see. Um, okay, so from John Lewis, this is a great follow-up. As a human, my security clearance and RBAC says what I can and can't do. I want my bot to be able to do as much as possible. Is there a vetting process for the digital worker? And I think Jim wanted yeah, to in, in our case, there certainly is. So if you're using an attended bot on your laptop and it's working with you, it only has your privileges using your CAC or your PIV card, right? That little nice little card that you pop into your computer to work. It is you working and going and doing things for you and coming back. For the unattended bot, the process owner is going to work with the risk management team and the roles-based access team to make sure that the bot only has the access it needs to do the work that it's expected to do. There's no reason in giving it any additional um, responsibilities or access, give it the roles and responsibilities it would normally have, and who better than the process owner to know what those roles are. Great. So the next question is from Joe Razor. Um, how do you make sure Outlook doesn't get upgraded without knowing to communicate with the RPA program? Yeah, you, your current change management. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, the CIO today has got a change schedule that says Outlook is going to change next week and it's a minor change and they publicize it out. You, your COE has to have a seat at that change management. I was, Jim, you and I are of like mind, my friend. One of the pieces of advice I was going to offer up is, is governance, governance, governance. Uh, like all things in IT, you have got to apply strong and mature governance uh, to your RPAs just the same. Uh, you have to be able to effectively manage uh, the changes associated to it. Mm -hmm. You know, and that uh, the idea of change management is incredibly important. There was a question that I had answer, or answered earlier. You know, we've had some, you look at IT, and so much of what IT does is often, you know, keeping the lights on type orientation. But at the same point in time, it's that governance, as you said, that protect that layer of protection that exists. And when you're working with them so that you recognize it, they should also be looking at RPA because a lot of the testing that they have to do, um, uh, often I've got some customers who've actually just made the first line of testing to turn on a, a digital worker let it run the process and see if it has any impacts. Once you've done that impact analysis, because anything that a digital worker can't do should come out as an error as based upon the audit and governance that we talked about, then you can address, make changes and so forth. But again, it all gets back to that communicate first and not try and do it proactive uh, as a result of a, re of a change or anything of that sort. And that again, gets toward that whole idea of resilience. Right. And the nice thing is unlike humans, you don't have to inform your bots that there's gonna be a change to SAP next week. You have to make the change in its code, but when your human workforce misses it because they were out on vacation or gone for whatever reason, 
and they don't hear that SAP is changing, they start calling your call center and your service desk and complaining about your IT support. So there's another instance where you've got a little easier change in there as a result of not having to call and bring everybody in and issue a change to the SOP. You just have to fix it at the code time. And, and again, with reuse that you end up looking for as you begin to pro programmatically break these things down into, you know, this is how you access SAP and then use that across many different digital workers, it becomes even easier to maintain than classic code within the bounds of every single application. Carrie and Dirk, just before I forget, today's my mom's 81st birthday. She retired as a worker from the VA and my dad's a VA user. Thanks for making the VA better over the last few years. Thank you. Thank them for their Thank service. That. Yep. So on that note, I think we're pretty much done. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists uh, for volunteering to participate and thank Kirsten for pulling this all together. She did a great job getting the panelists and organizing um, the pre-calls and getting us all together. So I'd like to thank everyone again and thank you guys for logging in. Yeah, thank you guys. And um, if anyone who is attending would like to participate in our AI data working group, we also have a project team for RPA, which is how this all came together. Please reach out. You should have my email address if you signed up. Um, if not, I'm just going to put it in the chat right here, but we're always looking for um, new members and additional participation. Um, and also, Nicole, you can come on camera, but if the panelists don't mind smiling, I'm going to take a screenshot picture real quick in uh, three, two, one, everyone smile. Thank you. And um, happy birthday to Jim's mom. <laughs> Okay, everyone have a good Thanks, rest guys. of your week. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. Bye. Bye, all. Thank you. Bye.